طيب today we are looking بإذن الله تعالى باب الغسل Now, so this is this is the situation pertaining to the Prophet ﷺ said when he was asked about a man, يُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ يَجِدَ الشَّيْءِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ A person thinks that something is going on in the prayer, like he feels some movement. So the Prophet ﷺ said, لا ينصرف حتى يسمع صوتا أو يجد الريح. Don't leave until you uh, hear the sound or you find the smell. So if you're unsure, have you broken your wudu or not? You, you're not sure either way then you stay in what you're sure of, which is that you have wudu. The situation I asked is different because you were sure you broke your wudu and you were sure you made wudu, but you're not sure of the sequence of them. Taib, bab al-ghusl. So ghusl linguistically is, as they say, isti'mal al-ma bi jami al-badan. Isti'mal al-ma'i bi jami al-badan. To use water on the whole of the body. Shar'an, when we say shar'an, it's the same as istilahan, this term we've used many times, which means the technical definition. Right? It's to use water, it's to worship Allah by using water on the whole of the body in a specific way. Okay, this is the technical definition of ghusl. So the first point that Imam he mentions, Rahimallah Ta'ala. He says, خروج المني دفقا بلذة He said that you ejaculate sperm, okay, money, with a burst. It comes out with a burst and it comes out with a feeling of pleasure. So first and foremost, we all know in English what is the definition of sperm, right? But what is the definition in Arabic? They say it's ماء غليظ أبيض. It's thick liquid and it's um, white, okay? And for the women, it's thick and, sorry, it's light, it's not thick for the women, and it leans towards a yellow color, okay? So this is uh, the sperm definition in the Sharia. طيب. So we said that it should come out a dafqan, right? It should come out dafqan and with pleasure. And before that, the Prophet Sallallahu is Sahih Muslim, he said, al ma'u min al ma. Ma is from ma, meaning that Ma meaning water and money. So the first one is money. That when you see money, then you need water. It means you need to make a ghusl. Al ma'u min al ma. In Sahih Muslim, right? And the stipulation that it must come out with the burst, does anybody know? Wa khuliqa min ma'in dafiq. He was created, man was created from that liquid which bursts, which comes out as an ejaculation, right? Sorry, I'm just a bit slow because I don't have a table. It's a bit awkward. Um, so he said, afterwards, the next uh, point he makes, La bidunihā min naim. He says, if it doesn't come out in the form of burst, ejaculation, right, nor with pleasure, as long as the person is not sleeping, then you don't need to make a ghusl from this. So what this means is that a person may be in a situation where he's sick. A person may be in a situation with extreme cold and due to these particular situations the money comes out of the private part right so he's saying in this situation because there was no burst and there was no pleasure then it's not to be treated as that which requires ghusl it's to be treated as urine okay it's just washed off and wudu is made it's been to be treated the same as you would with urine you wash it off and you make wudu why because it didn't come out with a burst and it didn't come out with pleasure right it just came out for another reason, like due to cold or sickness or any other reason. But then he said, except for the one who's sleeping. Why did he give this exception? Except for the one who's sleeping. What he means here is that if you're asleep and you wake up and you find wetness of money, then regardless if it came out as a burst or with pleasure, you still have to make the ghusl. Why? Obvious answer, because when you're asleep, you can't recall did it come out in that way. Did it come out in that manner, right? Dafqan or ladhatan. And also we have the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim 
where Umm Salim radiallahu anha, she came to the Prophet sallallahu and she said, Ya Rasulullah, inna Allah la yastahi min al-haq. O Prophet of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not shy from the truth. Hal ala al-mar'ati min ghuslin idha hiya ahtalamat. Does a woman have to make ghusl if she has a wet dream? The Prophet sallallahu said, Naam, idha ra'at al-ma. Yes, if she sees the wetness of the uh, ejaculation, right? So this is a proof that the person who is sleeping, it doesn't have to be based upon the definition that we said before, which is that it comes out as a burst or it comes out with pleasure. Okay, the exception is if you're sleeping, as long as you see the wetness and you know it to be money from its smell or its color, and then you go ahead and you have to make a ghusl. Okay, it's obligatory upon you. Mas'ala. What does mas'ala mean? Well done. Something which is asked about and researched. Mas'ala. If wetness is seen upon waking and the person is not sure what it is, what does the person do? Upon waking, a person sees wetness. It doesn't smell like sperm, doesn't look like sperm. He's not absolutely sure. So the ulama, they say, you have to recollect what you were doing before you slept. If before you slept, you were having some foreplay, erotic foreplay with your wife, not intercourse, foreplay, or you were having some erotic thoughts, right? Thoughts of shahwa, and then you went to bed, then we will say that this is madhi. Madhi is a prostatic, something like that, fluid, okay? Which comes out as a, as a result of foreplay, okay? It's different to money, okay? It comes out uh, uh, at the beginning of foreplay. When you have foreplay with your spouse, it comes out before you actually have intercourse. So this is the ruling that is given to it. If not, if you cannot determine that you had these thoughts before going to bed, then you will rule it as being money. You will rule it as being sperm. Okay? Especially if you remember that you had a dream of intercourse. If you dreamt of intercourse, then it's going to be um, ruled as sperm for sure. And if you didn't go through these steps what I just mentioned, then you rule it as also being money. طيب. The Imam, he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, وَإِنْ انْتَقَلَ وَلَمْ يَخْرُجْ اِغْتَسَلَ لَهُ If the money moves from its place, meaning that it's moving in your private part, right? You could feel it, it's gathering, it's moving, but it doesn't come out because maybe the person prevented it from coming out, or for whatever reason, it didn't come out, right? What is the ruling here? What is the ruling here? He said, you still have to make ghusl for it. Why? Because they say linguistically, the word janaba has the meaning of ba'ada, to be distant from something. So janaba shay means it moved away from it, right? So this money moved away from its place where it's made and it traveled down the private part, but it didn't come out. Therefore, they say it fits the uh, definition of what is janaba. Therefore, you have to make a ghusl from it, okay? This is the opinion of the author and those who agree with him. Another opinion of, the, of Imam Ahmed and Ibn Qudama and the majority, they say, no, you only have to make ghusl if you see the money coming out. What's the evidence for this? We mentioned it a few moments ago. Al-ma'u min al ma in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. That water or liquid is from water, meaning to say that when you see the liquid, that's when you have to use the water, that's when you have to use the ghusl. This is the evidence of the majority to say no, it's only if it comes out. طيب. The author he says, فَإِنْ خَرَجَ بَعْدَهُ لَمْ يُعِدْهُ If it comes out after you've made ghusl, okay, but without pleasure and without dafqan, not as a burst, it just comes out as a normal, like urine would come out, right? So if it comes out in this manner after you've made ghusl, then you don't have to repeat your ghusl, okay? You just treat it, you wash it off, and you make wudu. Because ghusl has already been made for it. It's, the ghusl was one cause, and that cause, you made the ghusl for it already, and it's uh, removed from your... Um, it's removed from you. The need to do it is removed from you. The Imam, the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَتَغَيِّبُ حَشَفَةٍ أَصْلِيَةٍ فِي فَرْجْ أَصْلِيٍ So he said, also that which necessitates that you make ghusl is if the private part is entered into a private part. But these private parts have to be asli. 
Why did he say this? To take out the issue that we mentioned before of the Khuntha, the hermaphrodite, who has two private parts. One is not the real private part, but one is. And as of yet, they're not sure which is which, right? So if this person had intercourse with one of their private parts, okay, then the ghusl is not required for that person because it's not asli. It's not, it's not sure, is it the real private part of, of that gender, of that person, right? So this is why he mentioned this point here. So anyway, another reason, or the main reason why ghusl is made, is if the private part enters a private part. Then he said, qubalan kan or dubaran, whether that's the front private part, okay, or the back private part. Walaw min bahimatin, or whether that's on an animal or on a dead person. And as we said previously, some of these things are very shocking to us and disturbing. But the ulama, they mention this because you never know. It may happen to you one day that you're an alim in the town and it happened to somebody that they fell into these munkarat and you have to advise them, right? People do fall into these kind of traps. That's why advice is given. So if the private part enters the private part. In Bukhari and Muslim, we have the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu narrated by Abu Huraira. He said, إِذَا جَلَسَ بَيْنَ شُعَبِهَا الْأَرْبَعَهَا الْأَرْبَعَ ثُمَّ جَهَدَهَا فَقَدْ وَجِبَ الْوُسَلِ The Prophet Sallallahu said, if, you, if a man sits between the four body parts of a woman and then he has intercourse with her, then ghusl becomes obligatory upon him. This in Bukhari and Muslim. We, and in Sahih Muslim, there's a narration which says, وَإِن لَمْ يُنزِلْ Even if the person doesn't ejaculate. So by virtue of the fact that you have entered the private part, right, to have intercourse, that then obligates a ghusl upon you, even if you don't ejaculate. Many people make this mistake. They don't make a ghusl because they didn't ejaculate. Okay? So the correct opinion, Allah knows best, there is opinion that some of the companions held, that until you ejaculate, you don't have to make a ghusl, but the overwhelming uh, opinion held by the scholars is this one based upon this hadith and others Tayyib Mas'ala What if somebody wears a thick wrapping on their private part and has intercourse what would be the ruling then? Hmm? <coughs> the same even if the person doesn't experience pleasure huh? That's up for debate what is thick <laughs> Not like a condom, a condom is considered thin. So something which is thick to the extent where they say that it affects your pleasure, you don't feel pleasure due to it. They say in this situation, Sheikh Hamad al-Hamad mentioned this in his explanation of Zad, he said in this situation where it takes away the pleasure, then the ghusl doesn't have to be made. Okay? Tayyip. Another reason why ghusl has to be made is Islam mukafir. That when a non-Muslim accepts Islam, they have to make ghusl according to the opinion of the madhab. Why? Because in Abi Dawood and Ahmad, we have the narration of Qais ibn Asim radiallahu anhu where he said, Ataytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uridu al-Islam, fa'amarani an aqtasila bi ma'in wa sidrin. He said, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanting to accept Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded me to make ghusl, okay, and to use sidr, which is a type of uh, way of cleansing yourself. Tayyib? So this is another reason, another cause why ghusl has to be made. And another narration by Imam Ahmed said that there's no need for the person to make ghusl unless there was a cause before his Islam. Meaning that before he accepted Islam, he was in a state of Janaba. So now he's accepted Islam, he needs to remove that state of Janaba. That's the second of opinion of Imam Ahmed. Okay? But the overwhelming opinion in the madhab is the one that we mentioned of the author. Another reason why ghusl has to be made is mawt. If a person dies in Bukhari and Muslim, the story of the one who was trampled by his camel, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, اِغْسِلُوهُ بِمَاءٍ وَسِدْرٍ Wash him with water and with sidr. Okay? So the people were commanded to give ghusl to this man who died. So ghusl at the time of... Uh, ghusl is also incumbent when the person passes away. But is this ghusl for the rough al-hadith? It's not for Raful Hadith, it's Ta'abudi. The illa here is Ta'abudi, meaning the illa here is Shayun la yu'aqal. We don't know why, so we submit to it. We submit to the con- command of the Prophet. Tayyib. Which believer is not to be washed at the time of death? Shaheed, huh? But not any Shaheed. Not even any Shaheed in Jihad. They say Shaheed al Ma'raka. 
Shahid al-Ma'raka is the one who died actually on the battlefield, not the one who had wounds and then later was taken off the battlefield, okay, and died. He's still Shahid, but the one who's not to be washed is the Shahid al-Ma'raka, the one who actually died on the battlefield due to wounds. The other next two reasons for having to make ghusl is hayd, which is menstruation, and nifas. And nifas, which is postnatal bleeding. Tayyib. In the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, فَإِذَا تَطَحَنَّا فَأْتُوهُنَّا مِنْ حَيْثُ أَمْرَكُمُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَحِّرِينَ If they, meaning the menstruating women, become pure, their blood has stopped, right? Then you can, uh, then you can come upon them once they have purified themselves, okay? Once they have purified themselves. And this is made even more clear in the hadith in Bukhari Muslim of Fatima bint Abi Hubaysh where she came to the Prophet وسلم, complaining about the blood continually coming to her. It didn't stop. It would come continually. So the Prophet وسلم, said, Da'i salah, leave alone the prayer. Qadr al-ayyam allati kunti tahidina fiha. Leave alone the prayer, the amount of days that you normally used to have menstruation for. Thumma ghtasali wa salli. And then may ghusl and go ahead and pray. So it shows here clearly that once you Hayd, once your menstruation has finished, and then you may ghusl and you can go ahead and pray. Tayyib. The Imam says, La wiladatun ariyatun and dammin. The exception from what we just mentioned, the postnatal bleeding, having to make uh, ghusl after giving birth, is not if the birth came without any blood. If no blood was found, and this is something nadiratun jiddan, this is something which is very rare, but if you happen to be one of those rare babies, you were born and your mother, may Allah have mercy upon her, didn't bleed, then for your mother at that time, she wouldn't have to have made a ghusl because there's no blood there. Who can give me a fiqh rule substantiating this ruling? A fiqh rule that I've mentioned many times. Substantiating this ruling. I'll mention the first one for you. al illatu أو الحكم you can say it the other way الحكم يدور مع علته وجودا وعدما the ruling is established due to its cause due to it being present or absent meaning that if a ruling if the cause is there the ruling is given if the cause is not there the ruling is also given a separate ruling is given okay الحكم يدور مع علته وجودا وعدما this is what they say because the blood's not there therefore the ruling of the absence of the need for ghusl is established. But if there was blood, then the ruling for ghusl would be established. The Imam, he says, وَمَنْ لَزِمَهُ الْغُسَلْ حَرُمَ عَلَيْهِ قِرَاءَةُ الْقُرْآنِ And whoever it's incumbent upon to make ghusl, it's forbidden for that person to read the Qur'an. Whether to touch the Qur'an or to read the Qur'an without touching, right? Narrated by Al-Khamsa, Ali Radhi, who are Al-Khamsa? Who, who are the Khamsa? Who are the five? When we say narrated by the five. Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Nisai, and Ahmad, Imam Ahmad, Rahimullah, Jami'an. Exactly. So narrated by Khamsa Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, Kana and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yukri'una al-Qur'an ma lam yakun junaban. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to read us the Qur'an as long, except in the state of Janaba. Okay, except in the state of Janaba. And also there's narrations from Ali outside of this, uh, which are even more authentic, where he says that none should read the Qur'an, not even a letter from the Qur'an, if he's in a state of Janaba, right? However, some of the ulama, they said that if what you're reading is less than an ayah, less than a verse of the Qur'an, then that's permissible for you to do so. And also if you didn't intend to read it as Qur'an, you might have read it as a protection, like in the Safar Dua or something of that nature, or reading the ayah before you go to bed, Ayatul Kursi for example, right? These are exceptions. But otherwise you shouldn't. He says also, وَيَعْبُرُ الْمَسْجِدْ لِحَاجَةٍ It's permissive for the junub, or the ha'id, the one who's in a state of major uh, impurity, to cross, to go through the masjid if there's a need for that. وَلَا يَلْبَثُ فِيهِ بِغَيْدِ wudu, And not to stay in the masjid unless they are in a state of wudu. So Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la taqrabu salat wa antum sukara, hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun, wa la junaban illa abil sabil, hatta yaghtasilu. Okay, hatta taghtasilu. Oh you who believe, 
uh, don't come close to the salah was being in a state of janaba, right? Until you purify yourselves and do not cross through the masjids until you purify yourself. With regards to staying in the masjid, as we said, you cannot stay in the masjid without wudu, right? In the Sunan of Sa'id ibn Mansur, Ata ibn Yasir radiallahu an, he said, كان رجال من أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يجلسون في المسجد وهم جنب إذا توضأوا ودوا الصلاة that they used to be companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that were in a state of janaba but they would be in the masjid sitting if they had made wudu which you would make for the salah right so it's permissible to come out of the ruling of not being allowed to sit in the masjid if you're in a state of janaba if you make wudu what does the wudu do to the state of janaba? It makes taqfif, it lessens it. You're still in the state of janaba, but there's a lessening of it, right? So then certain things are uh, allowed for you to do, like sitting in the masjid, and more will come to know now, in a few moments. And also, what is recommended to make ghusl for, not obligatory. The previous things were obligatory, right? Here it's recommended to make ghusl. وَمَنْ غَسَلَ مَيِّتًا The Prophet ﷺ narrated by Abu Hurairah, he said, مَنْ غَسَلَ مَيِّتًا فَلْيَغْتَسِلْ Whoever washes the dead, meaning the person that actually touches the dead, then he should make ghusl. And this is recommended for the person to do so, right? Not obligatory. أَوْ أَفَاقَ مِنْ جُنُونٍ أَوْ إِغْمَائٍ Or a person regains consciousness from one of the reasons for having lost his consciousness. بِلَا حُلْمٍ And this person was, he was in a state of being unconscious, he didn't have a wet dream, then this person is sunnah for him to make ghusl when he regains his consciousness. If he had a wet dream that he recollects, then of course he needs to make ghusl for that wet dream. Okay? If it's just the fact that he got his faculties back, he regained his consciousness, then it's recommended for him to make wudu. The Imam now, he's going to talk about al-ghusl al-kamil, the complete ghusl. Al-ghusl al-kamil, is that which contains conditions, shurut, that which contains wajibat, pillars or obligations, and that which contains sunnan. So this is why it's called the complete ghusl. He says the first thing is that you an yanwi, you make the niya, make the niya, okay, when you are uh, making ghusl, the niya to lift your state of hadith al-akbar and asghar, major hadith and minor hadith. What is the ruling of the niya? Okay, that's where it's places. What is the ruling of the niya? It's a shart. Like it was in wudu, right? Well done. Thumma yusammi. And then the person makes the tasmiya. He says the basmala. Okay? What's the ruling of this? It's wajib, right? Like it was in wudu, except? No, not this exception. Yasqut it's, ma'an It's overlooked if the person forgets it. Okay? It's overlooked if the person forgets to do so. Wa yaghsilu kafayhi thalatha. And the person has to wash his hands before making the ghusl three times. When is there an exception or when is there a change in the ruling to this? Here I'm saying it's sunnah. It's sunnah for you to wash your hands three times. Someone else. Exactly. If you wake up from deep sleep at night. Very good. وَيَغْسِلُوا مَا لَوَّثَهُ And he washes away that which the filth or the, the impurity is sunnah to do so, right? To wash that away separately is sunnah. وَيَتَوَضَّ And then he makes wudu. So he had niya, he washed his hand three times, he washed away the impurity, okay? And now he's going to make wudu. Making the wudu is also sunnah and this is something which there is ijma' upon as mentioned by Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and Ibn Battal. وَيَحْثِي عَلَىٰ رَعْسِهِ ثَلَاثًا تُرَوِّيهِ And then he pours upon his head three times water. Okay? Ensuring that it gets to the roots of his hair. Ensuring that it gets to the roots of his hair. This is sunnah also. Okay? What if the person has braids or plates? What are they called? Braids, right? When you do that, twisting it in your hair. Braids, yeah. The person has braided their hair, whether it's very tight or loosely. What if the man or the woman has braids? What do they have to do with their braids? Because I said the sunnah is to put the water three times and to ensure that it gets to your scalp. 
So they say that if the person has braids and the ghusl is for janaba, okay, not for hayd, the ghusl is for sexual intercourse, not for the menstruation, then in this situation, then of course the man doesn't have this, but uh, any janaba, the man and the woman have to undo their braids, okay? No, it's the other way around. In, in Zakallah khair. For the janaba, they don't have to undo their braids. For the haid, the one who has menstruation, she has to undo her braids, right? Why do you think this tafriq, this differentiation is given? So we're saying that the one who is, has, who is making a ghusl for sexual intercourse, he or she doesn't have to undo the braids. Okay? It's correct, yeah? And, and the haid, she is the one, the one who has menstruation, who has to undo the braids. Why possibly is this tafriq, is differentiation? They say uh, that the hayat, she has to do it because it's only once. So there's no mushakka here. Whereas to tell her to do it every time she has intercourse, which could be three times if they're newly married a day, then it's very difficult, right? So it's not something which is asked from them, because mushakka. وَيَعَمُّ بَدْنَهُ غَسْلٌ ثَلَاثٌ And it's sunnah that the person washes his whole body three times. وَيُدَلِّكُهُ and that he makes tadlik. What yudallikuhu is to use the hands to rub the water all over the body to ensure that it gets under every part which normally water may not get. You know if somebody's got a lot of flesh on them, sometimes under the chest parts, water won't get to. If you've got a healthy belly, under the belly, you have to ensure under the armpit, between the legs, these kind of things. Okay, it's a highly recommended sunnah to ensure that you do that when you are making ghusl. tayamun and to do the right side first, okay? And then he washes at the end of the ghusl, his feet in another place. According to the famous opinion in the madhab, the person washes his feet twice. He washes it once when he's making the wudu of the ghusl, okay? And then again when he comes out of that place, right? It's recommended for the person to wash his feet. This used to have a clear reason in their time and it may still do in times where you don't have fixed shower rooms like we do. If you live in a village, maybe the, the, the ground gets really muddy, okay? And based upon that, you've made ghusl in one place, therefore your feet are dirty, you have to get out and wash your feet again. And some of the ulama, they said, because this is an established sunnah, it's good to do from time to time, right? In the ghusl, once you've washed your feet, to, to protect the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, then from time to time, even when you've left the shower, wash your feet again in the sink or something of that nature. طيب. So this was the ghusl al-kamil. Now he's going to mention ghusl al-mudzi. A ghusl al-mudzi is the ghusl that suffices. Okay, that's a loose translation. And it's the ghusl which includes the shurud, the conditions and the wajibat only. So anything that you don't find in this ghusl is sunnah. Right? What you find here is that you have to do it. Outside of this, it's sunnah. So he says, wal mudzi an yanwi. So the first thing you do is you make the niyyah to remove your hadith al akbar and asqar. Thumma yusammi. And then you say the basmala. Thumma yu'ammim badnahu bi ghusl marra. And then you have to cover your whole body from top to bottom once. This is ghusl, okay, which is obligatory upon you. And the humbly scholars, they also add to this al madmad al madmada. Right? They add to these things that we just mentioned as being a must, the washing of the mouth and the nose. Why do you think they said that? What is the ta'lil? What is the reasoning? Good, you're, you're right, you're there on the right thought, but not exactly. Okay, so both of you put both your statements together. It's, it's that the water has to cover the whole body and the nose and the mouth is considered part of the body because water can go into the mouth to be washed and can go into the nose. Obviously, you wouldn't consider the ears as part of the body like that because you can't wash the inside of the ears. So they're saying the washing is for the outer and the inner. The inner wherever you can. And wherever you can is the mouth and the nose. Okay, that's why they, uh, they added it as part of the washing. And also it came in the hadith in Bukhari of Maymuna radiallahu anha in her description that the Prophet did this. So that means that you can do it while you're doing this. Because I mean, it's a, excuse me, during the normal ghusl, you do it during wudu for the ghusl. 
Yeah. But the new, in the normal ghusl, do you have to do it in the, when you're washing yourself as well? So in the complete ghusl, the ghusl al-kamil, you would do it like you said with the wudu. In the ghusl al mudze you can do it wherever you want. Do it wherever you want, right? Because this is the next point, the issue of tartib. Do you remember what tartib was? Sequence in wudu. So if somebody in a ghusl washes the bottom part of his body first, and then the top part of his body, his wudu is still valid. Okay, according to ulama of this madhab, they say his wudu is still valid. They say tartib is not an obligation, like it was in wudu. So you could do it however you wish, right? You do one foot here, part of your head if you're crazy like that, as long as the whole body is covered. What is their ta'aleem? What is their reasoning? They said it's, the body is considered one limb in the ghusl. So as long as that one limb is washed, there's no tartib here. Tartib is where there's extra, there's more than one limb. That's where the tartib has to be. And also they say mu'alat is not, mu'alat meaning the continuity is not uh, a condition of the wudu either. Uh, sorry, it's not wajib. The Imam, he says, That the person should make, should try his utmost to make wudu with the mud. A mud is this, okay? Two hands like this. This is considered a mud of a normal man, okay? So a mud is two, two hands of a normal person, right? And the sa'a is that times four, so eight handfuls, right? So mud is the two hands, sa'a is eight of, uh, eight of them, times four, yeah. So the Prophet Sallallahu is narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu in Bukhari, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يتوضع بالمد that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to make wudu with a mud ويقتصل بالصاع إلى خمسة أمداد and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would make ghusl with just a صاع up to the extent of five أمداد five of these times five right that's it and how about us we find ourselves 20 minutes in the shower right and this is israf the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم warned that he said that سيأتي في القوم أو في الأمة قوم يعتدون في الطهور. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم they will come upon a time my nation they will go to the extremes in making purification. So you find people sometimes they use so much water and this is israf. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's way was the best and he was the most clean of people. طيب if you go beyond that it's not a problem but somebody shouldn't be spending so much time in the shower right using so much water. This is israf. Water is a real special commodity that everyone has a right to. The author, you have a question? Oh, just waving at me. The author, he said, فَإِنْ أَسْبَغَ بِأَقَلْ If the person makes isbagh, who can remember what isbagh is? We mentioned this in wudu, isbagh al-wudu. Come on guys, you have to do more revision. Isbagh is, is, is like perfection. Perfection, what they mean, that each body part is given its right. Okay? In washing. So here he's saying that if the person makes isbagh of the ghusl with less than what was just mentioned, then that's well and good. The important point is that isbagh is made uh, when making ghusl. أو دوى بغسله الحدثين And also it's permissible, it suffices if the person um, when making ghusl, he has the intention to remove two states of hadith. And I said this is the correct thing that you should be doing anyway. When you make ghusl, you have the intention to remove both states of hadith. Hadith al-Akbar and hadith al-Asghar, right? Though Ibn Taymiyyah from the Hanbali scholars, he said, even if you made the intention just to remove the hadith al-Akbar, the ghusl, then that suffices you for the Akbar and Asghar, because the Asghar, the smaller one, is included in the bigger one. This is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah and those who agree with him. When you're making wudu, when you're making ghusl, what did we say the ruling of wudu was? In the ghusl? What's the ruling of it? Recommended, right? Sunnah. <coughs> now somebody's making a ghusl and they touch their private part. What's the ruling now of the wudu? Here, it's like in the previous chapter, they have to do it because it's from the naqid. Here, he has to make wudu, okay? Because he's touched his private part. Tayyip? So as soon as you touch your private part, you have to make wudu. The Imam he says, وَيُسَنُّ لِجُنَبٍ غَسْلُ فَرْجِهِ وَالْوُضُوء لِأَكْلٍ وَنَوْمٍ وَمُعَاوَدَةٍ وَوَطْئٍ It's recommended for the one who is in a state of Jinnaba. 
that when he wants to go to bed or he wants to eat or he wants to return to his wife then he has to again it's recommended to make wudu why because in sahih muslim aisha radiyallahu anha she said kana rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa idha kana junaban fa arada an ya'kul aw yanam tawadda wudu'ahu li salah that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he was in a state of janaba but he then wanted to go to bed or he wants to eat, he would make wudu like he would for the salah. What is the benefit of making wudu in a state of janaba before going to bed? For sure, it's sunnah. That's the, that's the first and foremost benefit. Everyone agrees to that, huh? No. It's takhfif al janaba so the angels can come. Because the one in the state of janaba, the angels will stay away from him, right? And also he said, for you also do the wudu if you want to return to your wife for a, a, another um, intercourse. Because in the narration of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَتَى أَحَدُكُمْ أَهْلَهُ ثُمَّ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَعُودُ فَلْيَتَّوَضَّى If one of you has come to his wife and had intercourse, but then again he wants to go to her again, then he should make wudu. And in the mustadrak of Imam al-Hakim, the Prophet ﷺ said, لِأَنَّهُ أَنْشَتْ لِلْأَوْذَى he said that the Prophet said this will help you when you go back to your family for another intercourse. That was mentioned by the Hakim in his Musadraq. We'll stop here, inshallah. We've come to the end of that chapter. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shortcomings and mistakes were for myself and shaitan. If you have any questions on the topic, feel free, inshallah. Yes. Not for the wudu. For the wudu wajib ahsant, but for the for the ghusl sunnah. Therefore, if they say that if you were to jump into a pool, right, with the intention of removing your hadith, as long as you went down, covered yourself, and you came out, and then made madh madhan istisyaq, you're done, right? With the with with having niya and basmala. So the washing, the washing is that, like we said, that every limb has to be covered in water. The tadlik, the rubbing, is something which is sunnah. It's something which should be done. It's something which is sunnah. But if you didn't do it, it won't affect the valid validity of your ghusl. So, what? Having a ghusl? You touch your private obviously you've got to clean your private clothes. What have you done that we can't come back to touching again? Because you've got to do wudu. Yeah. Well, what do you mean you have to do wudu? You mean you have to step back, do wudu again, and then? What? No, no, you, you can do that, you can do that, that's probably better, but you finish your ghusl, but then you have to make a wudu. And that suffices? That, that's a must, the wudu is a must, because you touch your private parts, right? As you would do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is... Uh, and then when you dry yourself, obviously, you have to be careful. Yeah, you have a nice big towel, <laughs> a fluffy one. <laughs> Wear a robe. Yeah, a robe. Good idea. Uh, but no. Today, sorry, with the, mm. with the use of showers, the way they did it back then, it was with bucket and probably a cup or something. Mm. You now you're okay. It. That's right. You, you can still do it. I mean, it's not that you mm. can do it. I'll probably save more water. But with the shower, uh, you know, you, should you should you get it first? Throw three cups of water over you, or three handfuls of water over yourself, mm. or rub your hair. That's mm. the shower, or is it? Mm. Just, it just you could do it under the shower, like make sure that you're rubbing three times, so that would suffice no, for that for the throwing of the water in your head. And so you, you, you right yeah, you yeah. So you would figure it out like that, basically. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you would figure out if you if you wanted to do it in that way. Tayyip, nothing else, inshallah. No. The basmala in the shower. Good point. Some scholars accept mm. it even in the toilet. Yeah. They said because mm. it's more important than. They said the wajib supersedes the makruh. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure to be honest. But the basmala, you would. Because uh, from what I remember, you would say it uh, like in your heart. That's how it would be said. Just before you start in the shower. If you can remind me uh, later that question on the group or something privately. Zakum la khair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah to make this deed heavy in our scale. Ameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa jazakum la khair.